Hey everybody, um, welcome to the Weekly Space. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and we have all of our friends this week gathered together to talk about, uh, mostly about inflation and confirmation of inflation in primordial gravitational waves. So, uh, and I am so glad we have got an all-star cast. Now, yes, I'm in a new location. Get over it. Uh, moving on. Um, so we've got Brian Koberlein. Hey, Brian. Hi. From RIT. Dr. Matthew Francis. Oh, I could not be happier. We've got Dr. Matthew Francis versus there we go. Brian Koberlein. Oh, this is the best. Mike Simmons from Astronomers Without Borders. Hey, Mike. Hi, Fraser. We've got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hi, Fraser. And Dr. Nicole Gallucci. My audio works now. Yay! Yay! That was Yay. close. It almost didn't work. What did you do? You turned it off, turned it back on again? Yeah, I, I reset the PRAM. Uh, Mike can tell you, uh, on Wednesday night, my speakers just decided to flip out and make this really high-pitched... Well, you didn't hear the noise. They made this really high-pitched noise just as I hit broadcast. Uh, and yeah, so I had yeah. to let the computer run the Hangout without me while I went next door to George's office. 
It, it, it was a learning experience. It was a learning experience for learning space. That's for learning space. Yeah. Let's learn how to use our computers. <laughs> Let's learn that we can't trust computers. That they're, we're one step away from uh, the uh, total robot apocalypse. I'll be the first against the wall. <laughs> the wall again. <laughs> I, for one, welcome our screeching computer overlords. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so this week we've literally got one topic. No, we don't. One no, big we don't. topic that no, we don't. just consume us all. And what every time... There's, because Ryan, somebody cancelled last week when another Ryan, organization had a Ryan big press release. And Matthew get tired. I will rile them up and send them back into battle against each other. Uh, it's just going to be it's going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. So I'm really looking forward to this. But in, dish, in addition, perhaps, maybe... Uh, we might also talk about some other things, such as uh, how people can nap the moon, just like the pros. You're, you're such a good partner, Fraser. We'll be talking. Such a good partner organization. We'll be talking about uh, waves on Titan, and I would love for us to talk a bit about Cosmos because that's apparently what everyone does all the time: is talk about Cosmos. Some people even do live shows right after each episode where they talk about it which is our good friends over at Astronomy Magazine have been doing that, and Discover have, have been doing a, a wrap-up. Uh, and also there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of exciting stuff happening in the sky shortly, and uh, normally that's Dave Dickinson, but Mike Simmons knows as much about all that stuff as anybody, so he'll be uh, catching us up on that. So without further ado, let's talk about uh, the show Cosmos. So who watched it? I did. Yeah. yeah? All right. Uh, did we like it better than the first episode? It's hard to tell. I'm, I'm live tweeting while doing it, so I'm not terribly paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> live tweeting, Cosmos, not actually watching it and really taking Well, I'm it. watching it, but then I'm saying, th and I'm, I'm, it's a community experience, really. I thought it was better. Uh, you know, Cosmos is maybe the biggest public stage that science has had in a decade or two decades, maybe even since the last Cosmos. Uh, and in episode two, you know, they came right out and answered the biggest question that is you know, out there about science today, you know, is evolution real, is it fact, uh, is it supported by science, and, you know, they came out and teed up on every one of those and, and gave a very strong, unflinching answer to each piece of that, and backed it up, I thought, with really clear, really <laughs> lucid explanations of, uh, of various concepts related to evolution and natural selection. And they had this great uh, graphic where they had... Uh, the creature, the sort of the, the, they showed the evolution of the eye. So they really oh, that amazing. The that's the toughest, or the, the thing that the creationists go after as much as they can, and they, they picked this as their example, and then they showed you uh, like the first version of what an, a light sensitive cell might have looked at, and what perception of the creature, and then they evolved it step by step, and just showed you what each one of these these different eyes might have given the given the creature and and how each one was a very useful evolutionary step and the great part was when they got to when the creatures crawled up on land they they still had these ocean based eyeball which was not that useful for for in the air and so how evolution adapted so so i i thought it was terrific i i really did i thought they they're really hitting the stride um anyone else all right, let's talk about inflation. I can't, I can't put this off any longer. All right, so what's the big news? Brian, can you give us the, the big intro? Oh, you're uh, letting him start. Er. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's the basic ever, overview. They, they, there was a team that was called Bicep2, and they looked at light from the cosmic microwave background. So, so they're looking at this background microwave glow, and specifically they're looking at uh, an aspect of light known as polarization. And basically, because of the variations in temperature in the cosmic microwave background, the light is polarized. And the standard way in which it's polarized is known as E-mode polarization. And as that light travels to us, a lot of things can happen to it. One of the things that can happen to it is that it can be gravitationally lensed. And that gravitational lensing can kind of twist that E-mode polarization into something called B-mode polarization. So, so they were looking at B-mode polarization. The other way in which you can get B-mode polarization is from strong gravity waves from an inflationary period. So if you have these gravitational ripples caused by the inflationary period, that would also cause B-mode polarization. So the key is distinguishing this kind of primordial 
cosmological B-mode from gravitational lensing B-mode. And they were looking at that, and, and the claim that they make is that they have found this primordial black, uh, sorry, primordial uh, gravitational waves uh, B-mode that is, is a strong signal as evidence of cosmological inflation. I didn't understand a word of that. Uh, Matthew Francis, could you uh, extend upon that? Okay, um, let me let me start back with inflation for a moment. Um, basically, no, I totally got. I, I totally okay, well, I know I know that. I'm just saying I, I, I'm going to fill in some of the gaps in Brian's yeah. explanation, and maybe we can oh, we can kind of make we, we can complement each other. Right, is my sound still a little weird? I plugged in my microphone better. That helped. It sounds like Daft Punk. Is it still sounding like Daft Punk? Yeah, it's just you though. Yeah, it is just me. Well, then I am going to abandon this microphone. I was it's hoping you'd sing worse. better, faster, stronger, more. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. <laughs> okay, anyway, I've, I've abandoned um, this microphone. This microphone is no good to me now. Can you? Do I still sound like Daft Punk? No, you sound better. Okay, all right. Uh, all please right. continue, Dr. Matthew Francis, to fill in some of the gaps. Okay, so b basically, um, the universe on the biggest scales, which is much bigger than galaxy clusters, much bigger than anything, any single structure we see, is remarkably smooth and uniform. Um, incredibly so. Uh, far too much, because if you look at two points on opposite sides of the sky, those two points basically have never been in contact with each other since the beginning of time. That's a pretty impressive thing. So why should they look like each other? Why should they be the same temperature? Um, and so uh, that's one of several problems in the vanilla Big Bang cosmology that that we we have. And so uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a group of cosmologists tried really hard to figure out how to fix that problem. And the solution that a lot of people settled on was something called inflation. The idea is that during its first instance, the universe, it was a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, the universe expanded very, 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 very rapidly. I think that's far too few varies. Um, like acceleration of light rapidly, right? Well, uh, yeah, you, it's, it's okay. If you were to take the inflationary period, two people standing next to each other in the next instant would be a light year apart. Right. That's that's the scale of which it's a factor of ten to the twenty sixth. Yeah. So that's how big inflation is. It's it's a it's not even it's it's barely even comprehensible, even yeah. if you're used to dealing with big numbers. That sounds like seven varies. I think would be appropriate. Yeah, I think more like ten to the twenty second. Ten to the twenty second. Okay. Yeah. So, but but the thing is that this is, in some ways, inflation is kind of the worst idea except for all the others, because nobody has quite figured out exactly how inflation should work, despite having over thirty years to work on it, um, and so most of us are pretty sure that inflation happened. Something like inflation must have happened. But we don't have a lot of direct evidence for it. And so that's why this particular result from the BICEP2 experiment is potentially very important because, as Brian was saying, inflation could have produced all of these primordial gravitational waves, these ripples in space-time as it happened. But here's the deal. Inflation is not the only thing that could have produced primordial gravitational waves. And also, as Brian pointed out, there's other things that can produce B-mode polarization other than primordial gravitational waves. So this BICEP2 result is really, really cool. But it, do not pop the champagne yet about Nobel Prizes. Do not pop the champagne yet about the discovery of primordial gravitational waves. And believe me, no... Oh, ways oh. more than I do. Right. Nobody wants them more than I do, because um, th this would be the most awesome thing. You know, yeah, I, I will be, I will be the first to be jumping up and down and and screaming if if this result is borne out. But we still have some work to do, and the next eight months between now and the next data that's released from the, the, the next set of experiments that are doing similar measurements, uh, theorists are going to be 
working really hard to understand the BICEP2 results. Other people are going to be analyzing the data. And this is great. All the data is public. Mm -hmm. So everybody can download this. Everybody who has the, the expertise can look at this, and they will be. We're going to see a lot of papers, probably too many. But <laughs> we will know in the next eight months, we will have some really good ideas about what's going on. Um, another thing that's important to point out is that there's a significant discrepancy between the BICEP2 results and earlier estimates on how big this B-mode polarization should be. Um, and admittedly, those other estimates are based on indirect measurements. Okay. So it's possible that we can get around that problem. And honestly, again, we're kind of hoping in a way that this, this result is correct because that means not only were there primordial gravitational waves, there were a huge amount of them, a lot more than we expect from, from other measurements. Okay, so I've got about eight questions here that yeah, I yeah, need yeah, to sorry. sort of line up here. So, so Brian, can you first explain what is a primordial gravitational wave? Well, a gravitational wave is a distortion in space-time. We've seen indirect evidence of gravitational waves before, for example, in a binary pulsar. Um, in this case, the primordial black waves, the, the can't say black hole, because... I keep wanting to say that. I know you That's, want to say primordial black hole. I don't mean to. Um, they, when you have this inflationary period, at least this is the inflationary way to, to, to go over, and that's the one I'm familiar with. I know there are other ways you can produce gravi these primordial black... <laughs> these primordial gravitational waves. The thingies, that wave. Uh, the, the idea with inflation is that when you have this rapid inflation... It's, it's causing these distortions within space and time, and it, it's almost like ringing a bell. It's like, bang! And then the whole thing just rings with these gravitational waves. And, and these ripples were formed in the earliest moments of the universe, and so that's why they're primordial gravitational waves. Now, if I understand look at gravitational wave in sort of the traditional sense, when you have massive objects that are moving around in space, you get this distortion of space-time, and these ripples move out, as you said, like ringing a bell, and they actually are sweeping, theoretically, although they haven't been detected, as they sweep past us here on Earth, our, right. our, our length or width or height actually change like a wave as this gravitational wave passes through us. So so yes. I might be, you know, X number of centimeters wide, um, and then as a gravitational wave passes through me, I will get a micro, micro fraction wider, and then it'll go back as this gravitational wave passes through me. So, so are these primordial gravitational waves, is, are, are they the same thing? Are they kind of rippling around and bouncing around, maybe not bouncing, but rippling through space right now, and is this what's been, this what's been detected? Right. They, they are, and in, in a way. I mean, they, they are the same type of waves, but on, on a large scale, they have a very specific pattern. So, and so, so the, the locally produced ones are, are very clear. They're coming from a source and radiating outwards, and these are on a cosmic scale. Okay. So then, and Matthew, when you talk about the BICEP experiment, so what is this experiment? What, what actually did the scientists do to, to make this calculation? Well, basically, when the universe became transparent um, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, um, a whole bunch of light just was released all at once, and that's what we call the cosmic microwave background. Um, I think my beach ball's out of reach. Um, Probably, somebody else probably has one in their office, though. Um, the uh, but uh, what the the fact that there are these these waves left over, or possibly there are these waves left over from the inflationary period, means that the light is passing through the ripples and getting distorted as it goes. Mm -hmm. And you can tell, by the way, I'm moving my hands how it gets distorted. Yeah. But it gets it gets twisted around because it's you've got all these you. Know, but frankly, random ripples. They're not coherent waves like you get from a binary pulsar. They're, they're very messy. And so that's exactly what we, we see. Oh, there we go. There we go. We've got, we've got the, uh, the W map uh, on Morgan's screen. Yeah, we're um, here. And this is, these are temperature fluctuations we're seeing here. Polarization is more subtle than that, and it's a lot harder to detect. That's part of the reason why this BICEP2 result is a really big deal, even if it turns out we have to modify it, because this is a very hard problem to, to solve. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, you know, we, we have to hand them 
all sorts of praise and kudos for this um, whether or not we refine what we think. Yeah, now, when I think about polarization, like the experiment I like to do with my kids with polarization is we, when we're in the movie watching our 3D movie and we've got our 3D glasses, and I always have them take their various 3D glasses and and push them together in different ways, and you can actually see how the, the 3D movies are using the polarization of light. That, you know, that light is coming at us, and it's coming at in horizontal, it's coming in vertical, and normally we see, with our eyes, we're seeing it all just all jumbled together. And the trick with the movies is that they're, they're shooting some light polarized one way, some light polarized the other way, and then when you wear the, the lenses, the one lens blocks the horizontal, and the other lens blocks the vertical, and so you get this... You get two different images coming into your into your eyes. So is it anything like that? That's what it is. I mean, the polarization because of the light waves, they they they're called transverse waves. But because they have an oscillation that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, it, that oscillation can have an orientation. And and if it has that orientation, that's polarization. But how do you see <clears throat> the gravitational waves? As expressed in the polarization of light, that's the part that's. Well, you know, if you if you look at a an image of like a gravitationally lensed galaxy, okay, you can see that the galaxy that's being lensed is is distorted. It's kind of warped and twisted a bit, okay. Well, if you have say a light wave that's polarized this way, when it's gravitationally lensed, it can be warped and distorted too. So it can be twisted into different orientations. And so that, that E mode can be twisted into a B mode form. These gravitational waves are doing the same type of thing. With, with the gravitational lensing, you have a localized mass that has distorted space and time around it, and that's why you get a gravitational lensing. In this case, the gravitational waves themselves are distorting space and time, and you're getting a similar type of distortion. So, uh, and uh, Dr. Matthew Francis, so if... If this is correct, and it is a sort of, uh, I guess, it is a confirmation of this concept of inflation, this way to explain, literally this way to explain, why don't we see the left side of the universe and the right side of the universe connected together? That that they just move too quickly, too early on for us to be able to see, you know, to see reflections in, in the universe. What does the, the sort of, the sensitivity of the experiment they've done so far, what does that tell us about how correct inflation is or how precise inflation is or this, the rate of the expansion or anything? Does this, does this help us sort of put some, some uh, guidelines in and some constraints on inflation? Well, that's a really good question because we don't know enough yet. Um, it is one thing to confirm inflation, and it's another thing to say this is going to what what this tells us about a specific version of inflation. Inflation is less a theory than it is what you get, what you have before you get a real theory. At this moment, um, there's a lot of versions out there, and so um, the, the the nice thing though is that we sh it it might actually have a kind of a filtering effect on our theories, just like W map and the Planck. Uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background, we're able to rule out certain models of inflation. Um, as we study this data more, we should be able to rule out even more. So whether one will be left standing, um, the simplest form, I believe, still stands based on what I've read. I haven't gone too deeply into it because, frankly, I think it's too soon. I think we're going to... I'm kind of taking the attitude, let's let ev other people, the experts in this area, slug it out. And then when they're done, I'll write about who's left standing. But uh, that's, that's, my, that's my method. But uh, um, I, I think... We we may see a theory stand. I'm actually kind of I'm actually kind of interested in another possibility, which is that this result may not correspond to anything we know right now, any any inflationary model. And I think that's actually a distinct possibility. If I'm right, I, I feel like making almost feel like making a Stephen Hawking bet on that one, Go because on. I think it's distinctly oh find that, yes, inflation is borne out, but not any version that we currently have. Um, that's probably because I'm perverse, but it's also, I think, you know, based on the fact that we don't have a good single theory of inflation that stands head and shoulders above the others. They all have some problem with them. Right. 
I say it, it may be not one of the popular ones because I, I honestly I don't know how many exact inflationary models there are. <laughs> too many, but a lot of too them many. are a lot of them are pretty elaborate too. Yeah. Now, if if this does get confirmed, do you think it's Nobel prizes all around? If, I don't know who gets it. Yeah. The one who, I mean, is it is it uh, <clears throat> the original inflation theory, or is it the one who got the right model, right? Well, I mean, that's a good question. Alan, Go Alan Guth's original version is very nice, and it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a lovely theory. It just doesn't happen to correspond to reality. Yeah, it's 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 a great idea that doesn't work. Now, now Brian, you've been trying to say primordial black holes. Um, I, isn't that one of the sort of implications of inflation and these these ripples of these gravitational ripples is one of these ideas is gravitational I, black, uh, primordial black holes? I, I want to say I primordial gravity don't waves. I don't know what, what it is. Uh, it it might be. I mean, I keep saying primordial black holes because that was my dissertation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it dealt with primordial black holes. Like, you went primordial black. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I actually don't know. I don't know if it would alter the the idea. I mean, primordial black holes are a part of early cosmology models anyway. So so the inflationary period, how that would affect the um, primordial black holes, I'm not sure. I just haven't looked at it in a long time. Okay. Does anyone want to ask any more questions or add anything about this? Anyone, the, the viewers, do you feel like you understand this enough to be able to, at a cocktail party, for example, uh, entertain your friends and colleagues. So, um, and let's see, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, this comes from Shivan Gupta. Um, what could the other sources of B-mode polarization be from that time, just after the Big Bang? So, uh, either, I would say, Matthew Francis, do you know of what any other sources of B-mode polarization might be? Well, the the one, and Brian mentioned this already, the one that can kind of uh, mimic... B-mode polarization comes from two possible sources. It comes from gravitational waves, but it can also come from lensing. And lensing is stuff that's in between us and the cosmic microwave background, so to speak. It's the cosmic the, the photons we're seeing come to us you know, thirteen point eight billion years without hitting anything in between, but they might have passed through some stronger gravitational field which will uh, twist and turn them around. And so uh, one thing that we have who are talking about this? Is I think it was what all the all the professional cosmologists I was in contact with on Monday were talking about during the press conference and the and the discussion of the paper was whether or not the model that they fit the bicep data bicep two data um, really fit the model of gravitational waves plus gravitational lensing. Right. Um, whether there's other possibilities, I think not. Um, um, I don't think there's anything else that can mimic those two things. So it's really the right. question of whether it's, one, whether we're really seeing B-mode polarization, and two, whether it's coming from lensing right. and gravitational waves, or, or the balance is off. Right. Okay. One of the things to keep in mind is you have E-mode and B-mode, and you have two different types of that you can have with E-mode. With B-mode, E-mode polarization is easier to find than any of the B-modes. And B-mode due to lensing is easier to find than B-mode due to gravitational waves. So, so what they've found here is they have clearly found B-mode polarization. I don't think anyone's disputing the fact that they have found B-mode polarization on a, on a cosmic scale. Yeah, well, I, I should correct my, my uh, statement, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question that a lot of it is being debated about is do they have a strong enough signal of primordial gravitational wave B-mode or is this predominantly just lensing B-mode? That's the real question. Uh, and, and that's still being debated because depending on how you look at it, the original paper that they are submitting for publication says that it's at five sigma, which would be an absolute valid thing. You can look at the data in other ways and say, well, it's more like 
2.3 or 2.7 sigma. That's not a confirmation. So, so one of the things that's going to be in peer review is can they make the five sigma claim or, or is it really not that strong? Uh, As we all call the Higgs boson, we want six sigma. We want six sigma. Well, five sigma is usually considered the cutoff. So, and I think um, they uh, 5.8 or 5.9. Uh, okay, so Tatiana uh, Velashenka, sorry about that. Val Mike knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> Valis, Valevska. Oh um, my gosh, no, Tatiana Vasilevska. 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 I, I cannot imagine gravitational wave, but what does it look like? Uh, funhouse mirror. Yeah. So imagine walking past a bunch of funhouse mirrors, um, but instead of it just being the image of what you are, it actually being you stretching and shrinking. So, um, fun, good times, uh, but painless. Um, Rich Hayward asks, does this inflation discovery have any implications for alternate theories like M-theory? As we all learned in uh, True Detective uh, with M-brain, with M-theory and brain theory, uh, the universe is like a wheel and it all just comes back to the beginning or something. So any implications? Inflation, M-theory. Many universes colliding strings. But, um, do you want to go, Francis? Do you want me to? <laughs> I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Matthew Francis take this one. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, so this is yeah, this is this is a tricky. Uh, again, uh, this is something I'm not particularly an expert in. So, um. And again, like inflation, there's many different versions of what what's called brain worlds, not B R A N E, not B R I N. Um, but it's the, the it's the idea that our basic it's it's even hard to visualize. But basically, our universe is one of several that exist together and they interact with each other because gravity can leak across the the extra dimension that separates them and there there are several models that involve collisions between these and that's what this this brain collision idea is I feel like my brain's colliding sometimes um, but some of the, the the I'd say the simplest versions do not produce gravitational waves in their Perfect. inflation like they don't have inflation like the the Big Bang plus inflation model that we've been talking about does. They have they have this tension between the brains has the same effect, but it's a different cause. But it, it, at least some versions don't produce gravitational waves. But I've heard people say that other versions do, and that's where I have to throw up my hands and say I don't know. Uh, so Nancy Graziano asks, uh, what do you feel is going to be the next big discovery breakthrough confirmation? Uh, so Brian, in this, in specifically in this field. So, I mean, imagine we launch the um, the cosmic polarization explorer mission, and its only job is like the W map, but all it's doing is searching pol for measuring polarization of light. We could get this to a very precise thing. So, what do you think is going to be a big, the next big discovery that we're going to be making on this? Well, I mean, or, or are we now just cleaning this up? And by we, no, I mean, no, I mean, just... there is Planck, and Planck can measure polarization. So, so there is polarization data that's going to come in from Planck that's going to be compared to this. Um, I think if you look at the, the next level, the next level is going to look at the connection between the gravitational waves and the density fluctuations, because there's, there's a way to compare that to actually distinguish between different inflationary models. And, and that would be the next step, is actually getting high-resolution observations of the gravitational waves. If, in fact, that's what they're for, then uh, we would start paring down which inflationary models fit and which inflationary models don't. We can do that to some degree with the data that we're going to be getting. But I think the next big breakthrough would be, aha, this theory, so-and-so's theory, is the inflationary model, and that is the one that the universe did. That would be the next breakthrough. Okay. Um, I think we're good. Oh, one question uh, 
from Adam, Syn Adam Synergy, uh, does the bias two result indicate that gravity is quantized? I think we've lost. Oh, Matthew Francis is put up. Not, not that I know of. No, okay. I, I, don't, I don't know of anything. We're not at that level yet. Yeah. Um, the idea is that if there are primordial gravitational waves, then they must be produced by some kind of quantum process. Right. Okay. Uh, well, let's. Uh, so, so that's good. So, we'll, we'll. I'm sure we're going to be watching this. We're going to be doing follow-on uh, episodes of the Lucas Fist Hangout where we give you guys all an update, and hopefully, this gives you enough of a background so that when we talk about it in shorthand and go straight to various modes of polarization and uh, and such, you'll be uh, you'll be ready to go. So, why don't we move on? I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, and we're going to talk about finding craters. First, I want to know what what is Matthew showing? He's showing this is using gravitational Charlie wave. Brown's head. This is using Charlie Brown's head as a gravitational wave detector. Okay, okay, just check. That's what I thought, but I was just checking. <laughs> I, I I made I gave a talk years ago called Charlie Brown's Guide to Gravity, wow. and uh, I realized that Charlie Brown is like the perfect person to use as a, an example for all of this stuff. So I used his head as a detector. Awesome. But uh, I think we have time. We don't have time to to explain it. So maybe I'll write a. I'll write a blog post and dodge the syndicate lawyers. Yeah, um, good luck with that. So, luck but anyway, that. I, surre that. I surrender the... the uh... <laughs> okay, so we had a very interesting story. This was actually a big moment for CosmoQuest in that last week uh, we put out a press release saying that we had this huge paper uh, that the PI Stuart Robbins has been working on for months and months and months. Uh, accepted in the peer-reviewed journal Icarus of planetary si Icarus is about planetary science. Uh, basically, demonstrating to the world that all the work you've done with moon mappers is totally valid and totally awesome and just as good as the experts. Um, so I can screen share one of the main images from this. Uh, oh, someone's already got it. Ha! Someone beat me to it. Sweet. Okay. So at the top are um, different expert uh, identifications of craters. These were done by eight different crater experts that range in experience from a few years to a few decades, using pretty much their own tools that they like to use. Um, and it it uh, that result those results show that there were differences uh, up to as big as a factor of two just between crater experts. And so it really hasn't been studied in much detail how different experts. Uh, rate different craters or measure different craters. Uh, as you can see, they're all off a little bit from each other. So even though this is a quantitative process of measuring and counting, everyone's going to do it a little differently. And so that has effects back through the whole history of the literature of crater counting. Um, and then uh, we compared the moon mappers classifications. You can see that on the bottom, and those are the red circles, all the individual uh, classifications, and although there's a lot more variance between the volunteers, when you average together the volunteer data, um, once you've gotten at least about seven or eight people, different independent people that have looked at and marked the craters, it is uh, right on par with what the when you happens when you average the experts together. So you actually um, are eliminating personal biases from having one crater expert map it. Uh, but when you recruit a whole bunch of citizen scientists to map it, you're getting rid of some personal bias and you're getting it done a lot more quickly. So this was one particular image that was done uh, by the citizen scientists and by the experts, but uh, in order to map all of the imagery that's coming back from LRO, which is our goal, we need a lot more uh, work to be done, and for that we need all the volunteers we can get. And so this um, big news, big paper, we've got a press release up on CosmoQuest. Um, for some reason the paper is caught in the queue in the archive, so um, the free version of the paper is not quite available yet. Uh, is behind a paywall of Icarus, but we've submitted it to archive and are waiting for that to unstick from the queue. So you all can read it. It's a huge paper. I'm going to be probably going to be blogging about it with um, Stuart and I are probably going to try and get some of this stuff uh, teased out from the paper and blogged about on the CosmoQuest site. So you can, if you're really interested in the nitty gritty details, you can take a look at that. We'll be uh, working on that. So that is our. Um, our demonstration of, of the results that uh, you guys have done, you guys have worked on, all you crater mappers out there, and an invitation to anyone who hasn't tried the project to come check it out. We have a lot more Moon, Vesta, and Mercury that need to be mapped. So this is confirmation of the of the theory. Of the method of citizen science, yeah. Of citizen science, that, that regular crater. people who just love science and right. have some time to spare can contribute right. in a meaningful way 
and get some work done that pushes science forward. And this is this is great. And I think a big kudos to you and to Pamela and to the rest of the CosmoQuest team for just making this thing happen and all of the outreach and, and effort that's been going on over the over the years, culminating in a serious, significant paper showing that this is legit. And I know that those poor scientists who had to just go and classify those craters are yeah. so grateful that yes. this army of, of volunteers is out there. And I think, you know, this is really part of what we're trying to do with CosmoQuest is like, we know that you love space and astronomy and even though you're working as a doctor or a uh, engineer or, uh, you know, you're going to school for something else, you really want to be in space and astronomy. And instead of dropping everything and going back and doing what... Uh, what Nicole and uh, Brian and Matthew did, you can just jump in at whatever level you have and and uh, and you know contribute to mm -hmm. meaningful science research. And in fact, the, with the other courses, which I don't know, is your has your course filled? Have your courses filled up yet, Nicole and Matthew? Um, we still have one by Peter Dove, uh, the astronomical imaging course that starts in about a week. Matthew yeah. starts on Tuesday. That so starts on time. Oh. Right. In addition to you, you know, your raw human ability to distinguish shapes, <laughs> we want to teach you more. We yeah. want to teach you how to uh, un recognize alien life. We want to help you learn planetary geology and uh, and and. Cosmology. So, so I want to get you guys doing radio astronomy. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for the next wow signal. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think this is this is great. And so if you have if you're interested in science, if you have this in space and astronomy and you have this sort of sadness that you didn't become the astrophysicist that you always knew you could be, we have all of the resources available to you to to take that to the next level. So uh, you know, it's such great work, Nicole. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, so I'm I'm very excited, and like I said, we there's a I mean I we did a set of video tutorials which you can watch to, that'll kind of get you started, tell you how to do it, or we've got you know screenshots that that show you how to do it too. Um, so you can kind of pick whichever way you want to learn. It only takes a few minutes to get set up. Now, Not to steal anyone from Moon Mappers, but if for some crazy reason planets aren't your thing, uh, I think Sloan Digital Sky Survey you can do a similar thing with galaxies and finding and classifying galaxies for them. So if that's more your thing, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a that's the bigger theme I think is just mm -hmm. really recognizing that that regular folk who have a lot to contribute and there's a way to bring this together. I mean the birders have been doing this for hundred years and, and other scientists mm -hmm. are starting to right. have the tools that they can do this as well. Um, okay, so now I'm a sailor, Morgan, and uh, I like to I mean, I'm not a big fan of waves though. And so I was all set on taking my boat to Titan. Uh, what am I looking at? Yeah, well, so first off, you'd still be pretty safe to take your boat uh, to Titan unless you made your boat out of, like, paper mache. Um, I might have. So Titan is one of the most remarkable bodies in the solar system. It's the only moon in the solar system with a meaningful atmosphere. Uh, in fact, its atmosphere is thicker than that of the Earth's. Uh, and it's also the only other body in the solar system, planet, dwarf planet, moon, to have liquids on the surface other than the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, the former fact that there's this big, thick atmosphere makes it rather difficult to observe uh, the latter. And so I can uh, try my hand at sharing another picture here. So this is a map uh, uh -oh. of one of the... the black screen. Get you shared too screen. many times. Oh, no, there it is. Now it's coming all right, so this is a, one of the poles of uh, Titan as seen by the Cassini spacecraft in orbit about Saturn. And what you can see here, these white areas are places they don't have data. These big black areas are regions that are extremely flat uh, on, this, on the surface. And this is measured by bouncing radar off the surface and watching it come back. And these really flat areas, uh, cleverly colored blue, have been interpreted as lakes of liquid methane. So it's about 180 degrees below zero centigrade uh, on Titan. So there's no liquid water here. Water is as hard as rock. But we do have liquid methane, and it's formed all of these presumed to be lakes that we see. But every time we made a measurement of how flat these lakes were, 
we found them to be basically as flat as you could possibly measure within the tolerances of the observation. And so people use that to conclude that there wasn't any waves on the surface. But that's changed just this week with uh, a talk from the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference uh, that found possible evidence. I, I want to strengthen that possible evidence uh, for waves on the surface of Titan. And this evidence comes from four pixels uh, in various observations of the surface that were a lot brighter than they expected. Uh, and of course this can happen, you know, like with any other measurement, just due to random error. But they're pretty sure that these are actual real fluctuations. Uh, but they don't have to be waves. They could be an iceberg, has been another suggestion. Uh, another reason maybe not to take your boat there, but uh, it could be an iceberg. It could just be like a shiny mud flat uh, also. So we're not sure that it's waves, but if it is waves, they're really small, and we're talking just centimeters high. Uh, so these are like ripples in a pond more than, you know, thinking ocean waves. But that could change in the coming years. Uh, Saturn takes, you know, quite a while to orbit uh, the sun, and the system takes quite a while sort of to rotate on its, on its tilt, just like the Earth rotates, uh, or just changes, you know, which angle it's pointing towards the sun. And so that means the seasons are very long. And we're just starting to enter spring in, at Saturn. And of course, we know here on Earth, when you get spring, it warms up. And when you have these warm, rising currents of air, you can start to generate wind. And wind is the primary driver of waves here on the Earth. So if we come back in a year or two years, and fortunately Cassini will be around hopefully for at least the next two years, we might start to see these centimeter-sized waves really picking up into, you know, what you might actually consider waves and not just, you know, ripples bouncing around. Awesome. I think, you know, another good reason for us to send a sailboat mission to Titan. Yeah, well, so when Cassini landed the Huygens probe on the surface back in 2005, and it took images of the surface, they actually did design it as a boat uh, because they were very hopeful that it would land in a lake. In fact, they hadn't even confirmed that lakes were there yet, but they, they expected them, and they designed the probe to float around in the lake uh, like a boat if it happened to land there, but it ended up landing in like a desert instead. That would have been really cool if it had Unlucky. landed on, on, on a lake. That would have been like a discovery of liquid on Titan and images from the surface of Titan all at the same time. That would have been yeah, amazing. No kidding. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So I just we've got a little more time left, and uh, normally this is Dave Dickinson's job, but he, I know he's busy today. Mm -hmm. We've got Mike Simmons, who is uh, from Astronomers Without Borders, and there's a few events that are coming up in the next couple of uh, next couple of days, weeks, months that people might want to be aware of. So, so Mike, what do you want to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about just April because I think there's enough going on then uh, for people to know about. And some of it's available online, so even if you can't get to it or if you had success like the recent uh, um, lunar occult, I'm sorry, asteroid occultation of the Bright Star Regulus, which I'll mention real briefly, uh, which was completely clouded out everywhere. Uh, th there are a lot of things that you can see that are going to be pretty cool just over the next month. So I'll mention first because I know a lot of people have heard about this unusual event where an asteroid, which from Earth is a really, really, really tiny object, <clears throat> went straight across in front of the bright star Regulus, one of the brighter stars in the sky. And this was big news, and there were people all over in this long path. You had to be in just the right spot in order to catch this. Um, that, that we're observing it. And there hasn't been a single report that I've seen of anybody seeing that successfully. It's been cloudy every place, uh, mostly along the eastern uh, coast of the United States. And, I, and, and just so people understand why this is uh, more than just cool that's scientifically useful is by f seeing exactly where people can see it, where the star blinks out and where it doesn't blink out, even though we can't uh, see the asteroid itself and get its shape and size, you can figure out from basically the shape of its shadow, where that shadow sweeps across the ground, where people see it and don't see it, what the shape of the thing is. But you need a lot of observations, and I'm afraid that didn't happen this time. So that's a scientific reason for it. And even though, well, you know, it's, it's uh, it, it, we've gone to a few asteroids, but 
there are millions and millions of them out there that we haven't yet, so it's it's very useful. Well, and it could have um, been like one of the one of the possibilities was that we might have been able to discover a moon for the, for the asteroid, and again, so no observations, no data, no moon. No moon. No yeah, moon. and that's a that's a possibility. Uh, that one's it's really tough because things have to be just right because that moon could be anywhere around the asteroid and it's going to be a really fast blink of the star. So so that's the kind of thing you'd want to have several observations of. Uh, it's pretty tough, but uh, but it is possible. But, you know, when it's cloudy, uh, everybody's got an equal shot, which is zero. So, But I think it would have been neat if you had lived in that corridor and it had been clear. Regulus mm. is a really bright star, and so you would have literally, if you there, you would have watched Regulus sort of fade away while all the other stars were were just stayed the same. So it would have been yeah, pretty yeah. neat to see it. It's really unfortunate that that everyone was clouded out. Well, well that's the point. That stars are really just points of light, actual points, and they don't have any size. Yeah, yeah, and Regulus is a big star, <clears throat> big bright star, and from, our, uh, from the distance of Earth it's so small. Like Morgan says, it's just a point of light. And you just see it blink out, and if you didn't know what was going on, it would be really freaky. Uh, but it would come back, so there you go. Uh, now, also in terms of things disappearing in the sky, um, there there is, I want to mention that there's a total solar eclipse. Uh, lunar, end of lunar eclipse. April 29th. Well, no, there's a total, oh, there's a total solar, solar, solar one, yeah. Yeah, this is two weeks after the lunar eclipse. That's not just a coincidence, but I think everyone can figure that one out. They happen at new moon, lunar eclipses happen at full moon. And that's on the 29th, but that one is primarily for for penguins because it's a narrow path in Antarctica. Uh, it does go up the coast of Western Australia and hopefully there will be people there. Uh, an annular, uh, I'm sorry, this is not a total uh, solar eclipse, it's an annular eclipse. So I made my notes in error here and just read them without thinking. But an annular eclipse is when the moon is not quite big enough to block out the whole sun. So you get a bright ring of the sun's chromosphere, the bright part of the sun around the edges. And there are a lot of interesting phenomena associated with that as well. Um, so we uh, hope that uh, all those millions of penguins get a good, good view and also some people in, uh, I'm sorry I said western, I, apparently uh, when I go to the southern hemisphere I get everything backwards. It's eastern Australia and so there could be some people viewing that, but it is a partial eclipse for all of Australia and, and a lot of the South Pacific. Now the bigger event, and this is a, uh, visible to people all over, uh, the, technically a solar eclipse is really an occultation. It's one object, the moon getting in front of the uh, other object, the sun, and blocking it out. A lunar eclipse is when the moon actually goes into the shadow of the Earth, so it's blocked from the sun by the Earth, so it's Technically, it's not. It's uh, uh, well. This is this is an eclipse. The uh, solar eclipses are uh, occultations, but we don't won't worry about that. It all looks the same. And what's cool about the lunar eclipse? Now, this will be visible. And let me see if I can bring that up here. You know, I think I might get a black screen for that, but you tell me. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, I think that's working. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yep. So. <clears throat> So what we have here is a diagram that shows um, how the moon is slipping into the Earth's shadow. That would be marked as the umbra there, which means, strangely enough, shadow. And uh, the penumbra is, is where it is partially covered. This, the sun, uh, part of the sun is shining on the moon. So it'll dim, and it goes completely dark. Uh, the darkest part when it's in the center there. Now you see it's it's uh, shown as kind of orange, and this is what it looks like because the shadow has a rim. It has a, a red light that's streaming through the Earth's atmosphere and bending. It's sort of like getting a sunset on the moon. The light refracts in the edges of the atmosphere around the Earth. So if you were on the moon looking up, you would see the Earth's night side, but around the edge you'd see some light from the sun coming through and that would be reddish colored, so the moon can look very red. And weirdly, this is the, uh, a rare phenomenon where the weather on Earth affects what you see in the sky. So if it's cloudy everywhere around the edge of the, uh, of the, the Earth, then it gets really, really dark and if it's clear it's a bright red, so you never know what you're going to get with this. 
And that is visible. The down here you can see at the bottom part of it, you can see the um, the uh, a map of the world. It shows that the entire eclipse is visible for most of North America and the western edge of South America. It's a going to be partially visible from other areas. You aren't going to see anything from from uh, much of Asia and. Uh, in Europe and uh, the eastern half of Africa, but hopefully there will be people that are uh, broadcasting this, webcasting it, such as David, who I'm trying to fill in here for, which is a difficult task, and some other people, and uh, this is on a, uh, let's see, I think it's during the week, but uh, it would be a cool thing for virtual star party or something. Yeah, we're definitely going to be broadcasting it. I know Scott is uh, getting organized, and we've got a couple of astronomers that have committed to, to broadcasting it, and, it's, and we'll, we'll definitely be showing uh, showing off the eclipse when it happens. I, but for me, it's great. It's literally, I'm at the center of it. I've, on the west coast of North America, it's just going to be absolutely perfect. So well, I want to try and watch with my own with my own eyeballs. So we're, we're running out of time now, so, so just remember, set your... Make sure you set some time aside, either to watch it in person or through the internet if you if you have to. Absolutely, <clears throat> that's great. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so we're gonna wrap this up. I give people a chance to shamelessly self promote themselves. Uh, Brian Coverline, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me at briancoverline.com or on Twitter at Brian Coverline or on Google Plus where I post every day. Awesome, Dr. Matthew Francis. Where do we find out more? You can find my uh, professional site at bullerhatscience.org, also on Twitter at Dr. M. R. Francis, um, blog at Galileo's Pendulum, and uh, also put in one more plug for our upcoming online classes at cosmoacademy.org, including one that starts next Tuesday. All right, Mike Simmons, where do we find out more? Well, the main thing is here, and I'm just I'm going to share this because people have seen me already, and that's no need for that. Astronomers uh, Borders, uh, April's Global Astronomy Month. You can watch some events there that I didn't have time to talk about online. Uh, some observing events, more about the Mars opposition, and seeing that online as well as some asteroids and other cool things. So go here. It's a uh, Global Astronomy Month. It's G A M hyphen A W B dot O R G or astronomerswithoutborders.org and learn what's going on and how you can participate and learn more than I had time to tell you about. All right, we're going to find more. Yeah, well, first off, if you had a question today that you didn't get answered, I'll be answering those this afternoon uh, on the Google Plus Space community. So if you head over to Google Plus, you choose communities. Uh, space, I think, is about the biggest one. And I'll be there answering questions about all these topics and anything else you might have uh, for the rest of the afternoon here uh, in the United States. Uh, you can find me at CosmicChatter.org or on Twitter at Cosmic underscore Chatter. That's fantastic, Mark. Yeah, you've been doing this several weeks after the uh, Weekly Space Hangouts, and I think it's just absolutely terrific that you go into the space community and, and take on all commerce, people's questions about space and astronomy. I think that's just fantastic. So, so if you want more... Follow Morgan to the space community and uh, just hit him with questions. Uh, the harder, the better. Uh, Nicole Galucci. Dr. Nicole Galucci, where do we find out more? I live on the internet as Noisy Astronomer. You can find me under that name. Uh, and I work over at CosmoQuest. So come to CosmoQuest.org and do science with us. Uh, I'll be tweeting, I'll probably be tweeting along with Cosmos again and uh, working on uh, the Mavers projects during the commercial breaks. So let's see how many images we can get done on the commercial breaks for Cosmos. That's, that's awesome. I'm sure Fox really appreciates that. I'm sure they do. <laughs> uh, okay, so of course I am the publisher of Universe Today. Uh, you can always check out my YouTube channel where we've been posting lots of our Guide to Space videos and really cool interviews with astronomers. Um, uh, universe, uh, sorry, patreon.com slash universe today if you want to see how you can get involved in, in the Universe Today community. Um, uh, so the next thing is going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night, and uh, I'll be in transit, but I hope to make it back in time for that. Um, and then on Monday, Sandy is going to join me and Pamela for a very special episode of Astronomy Cast, which was what happened at the uh, Lunar and Planetary Science uh, Conference, which Pamela had to miss, but Sandy got to go, and she will tell us what she saw and what she learned. And uh, 
So we're really looking forward to that. Sandy, of course, has been in the weekly space hangout quite a bit, and uh, it's always a treat to talk to her. So um, thank you, Nicole, for bringing her into our orbit, which is just great. I, that was Pamela, actually. Was it Pamela? Pamela, okay. Pamela introduced me to her, and then, I, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you can totally thank Pamela for introducing us to Sandy, because she's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we've got her deep ingrained into the process now, which is great. All right, well, hey, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thanks to the panel for joining us, and thanks for going deep on... Uh, on this discovery, confirmation of inflation. I, I've been looking at the Q&A, and a lot of people have said this is one of the best explanations that they've seen, even better than, than Professor Ryan Cox using a piece of paper on the BBC to try and... <laughs> so, um, nice. It only took two of us 20 minutes. To 20 minutes of me just asking questions like a four-year-old until we got to the bottom of it. So, yeah, um, I still don't understand it. Yeah. yeah, I think that was great. So thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all next week. Mm-hmm.